Well, welcome everyone, whether you're here in person or if you're watching us online, we are so glad that you're joining us for our third week of How Do You Know? My name is John, I'm a member here at BRAC. Once in a while, Dave gets courage enough to let me speak. So I'm here today, I'm excited to be talking to you about this. The, uh, Pastor Isaac and I have actually been teaching this series to uh, our, our students, high school and middle school students in youth ministry on Wednesday. And the first week that we kicked this off, um, we were talking about how do you know. It's an interesting question, just, just that itself. If you work with teenagers at all, you probably hear it more along the lines of, well, how do you know? You know, they're not asking it because they want to acquire knowledge. They're asking it because, well, they're challenging your authority or the idea that maybe you actually know a little bit more than them. I can't say I didn't do the same thing as a teenager, so it's fair. But this is, this is an interesting question. How do you know? And I, I challenged the middle school students on the first week and said, how is it that we come to know something? Like, how do we acquire knowledge? And we talked about it for a little bit. There were a lot of ideas thrown back and forth. But the consensus came about that it's something we, we acquire knowledge because we learn it. Whether it's taught to us by a teacher in a lesson at school, or it's a message that we hear from a speaker, or maybe we read something and we are able to logically reason it out and come to a conclusion on our own. Or maybe it's an experience that we had in life that we learned from. But regardless of the method of it, most of the time we learn something, we come to acquire knowledge by learning it. It's taught to us. And I think this is something that's important to keep in mind as we're moving through this series because each week kind of builds on what we learned the previous week. The first week we asked the question, how do you know the gospel is reliable? And Dave walked us through a series of events, historical, that, that showed it was man that lived at the same time as Jesus, witnessed his life, some of them even lived with him through those times, that wrote these, these books, these scriptures down, and that is how we are able to, to see that it is reliable because it is historically accurate. And it's important to know that the scripture is, re, is reliable because last week we asked the question, how do you know Jesus is the only way to heaven? And because we have that reliable gospel to look at, we're able to see that Jesus tells us in the gospel that he is the only way to heaven. And not only that, but Christianity is the only religion in which God comes to find us. So we're up to week three. We're going to ask this question. How do you know God wants the best for you? Now, some of you may have asked this question. Some of you may be struggling with it. I struggled with this question through high school and even in some of my early adult years. How do I really know that God wants what's best for me? Because sometimes I think I know what's best for me, right? Sometimes we have that idea that, well, you may think that's good for me, but you don't really know me. So how can we know that God truly does want the best for us? And we kind of answered this just a second ago, and, and I'm going to go back and revisit what was said last week, and that is Christianity is the only religion in which God comes to find us. And this is the basis of what we're going to build off of today to show that God truly does want what's best for us, because God will come and find us. He will seek us out. And this was recorded as early on as the Garden of Eden. God created the world. He created Adam and Eve. He gave them the garden to live in, this perfect place. He said, go, enjoy it. I'll be down to visit you once in a while. By the way, don't eat from that tree. That's it. But what happened? Well, along comes the serpent. They're tempted. They eat from the tree. And all of a sudden, their eyes are open. They knew they were living in sin. And then God comes, and what happens? The man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God among the trees of the garden. But God called to them, where are you? Now, God, again, he comes to find us. I kind of think a little bit like hide and seek, right? There's, there's the people that go and hide, and then there's the, the person that has to go and seek. I was a champion of hide and seek as a kid. I found the best hiding places. 
And as I got older, that worked really well because as I got into helping out with student ministry, we went to winter camp a few years back and they did a game where the leaders would go and hide and the students had to go and find them and they never found me. I mean, at one point, one, one kid walked by and, I mean, he could have stepped on me. I reached out and I even tapped his foot and they still didn't find me. I mean, they're middle school students, not the most observant, let's, let's be real. But I love hide and seek, and I feel like th- that's kind of what Adam and Eve were trying to do here is play hide and seek. But even as good as I am at hide and seek, I would lose if I played with God. Because he knows everything. He sees everything. He is everywhere. So the fact that Adam and Eve go and try to hide from him is kind of silly. And when God calls out to them, where are you? It's not because he doesn't know. But it's because he wants them, he's he's saying, I'm coming to find you. And I think playing hide and seek with God would be a little bit like this. This is how my son played hide and seek with me. He, um, He wasn't great at it. He would say, Dad, let's play hide and seek. Okay, you go hide. I'd count to 20. Say, I'm going to come find you. And inevitably, this is where he was. He would always go to the bathroom. He would hide behind the towels, and obviously his feet are just kind of like sticking out there. Very obvious where he's at. But I would still come into the room and be like, oh, where's Aiden? I can't find you. That's what it's like when you try to play hide and seek with God. And it doesn't matter how much you try and hide, because guess what? God comes to find us. Sorry, something going on with my mic. God comes to find us. And the reason God comes to find us is because he wants to have a relationship with us. He's seeking us out. And what's interesting about this, and I use the word relationship, because relationship means more than just an acquaintance. It's more than just knowing who someone is or knowing a little bit about someone. A relationship means you truly get to know them. You know everything about them, or you desire to know more about them if you don't know enough. And God seeks us out. He comes to find us because he wants to have a relationship with us. Now, I know the word relationship can also kind of be a little bit intimidating, right? I I think about it in terms of especially when it comes to spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, things of that nature, right? We talk about a relationship. It can be a little intimidating because we think, I need to impress this person. I want them to like me. 25 years ago, a buddy of mine set me up on a blind date. And I wanted to make a good impression on this girl. And I remember this date very, very clearly, and unfortunately, so does she. Yeah, you can see where this is going. I was late picking her up because I was working. And I worked on farms, and it was haying season. And if you know, you know, when the hay is on the ground and there's rain coming, you bale that hay and you get it in the barn because you don't want to get rained on. And I finished with with my chores. I raced home, and of course, I'm going to get cleaned up because, again, I want to make a good impression on this girl. So I, I shower, I pick out, like, the perfect clothes, and I knew I had to impress her with my looks because my car definitely was not going to impress her at that time. I'm late picking her up. She gets in the car. We start heading to the mall. It's the 90s, okay? Give me a break. It's the 90s. We go to the mall. On the way out of town, I see flashing lights behind me. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I pull over. The cop comes to the window. And I turn and I look at her. And she is leaned over, her hair hanging in front of her face, hiding her face. And she whispers to me, Don't let him see me. My dad's a constable. He's friends with all these cops. If my dad finds out, he will come pick me up. Man, I am killing it. I explained to the officer, there's no way I could have been speeding because this car doesn't barely go 55. Doesn't matter. Get a ticket. We continue on towards the mall. And on the way, we decide, "Let's, let's grab something to eat. We got time before the movie. Let's grab something to eat. She says, you pick the place. I pick the place. I think it's a great place. We order our food. She doesn't eat. Now, (laughs) 
She says, oh, I was, I was nervous. It was a first date. I'm like, well, I'm betting you didn't like the food and you just didn't want to say something. I picked a terrible place to eat. So then we go to the movies. You picked the movie. All right, I picked the movie. I found out a couple weeks later. I picked the movie she'd already seen. Yeah, yeah, you can see where this is going, right? Like, it just keeps getting better and better. So then we're driving home. And I noticed my car is getting louder and louder, and about a mile before her house, there's a very distinct clang, followed by a horrible scraping sound and sparks flying out behind my car. Yeah, my beautiful car decided to let go of the muffler at that time. But not all the way. He wanted to just drag behind. And I'm like, there's no way I can pull up to her house with this thing making this kind of noise. So I pull over. I'm kicking the muffler to get it to finally fall off, toss it in the weeds, drive to her house with my car now sounding like a tractor. I mean, good news, it's Austinburg. They're used to tractors going by. And I'm like, this is, this is a disaster. Again, it's the 90s, so in my head, I'm thinking of MTV's newest reality show called Worst First, where they go and video the worst first dates ever and retell those stories. I walk her to the door to say goodnight, thinking, this is never going to happen. And I'm going to go tell my buddy, don't ever send me up, set me up on blind dates again. But instead, as I walk her to the door, she turns and she says to me, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you come see me again? Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> the clothes worked. She forgot about everything else. <laughs> Woo! <sighs> Thank you, Airwalk. So I said, sure, I'll come see you tomorrow. And I'd like to stand here and tell you that the second date was phenomenal. It wasn't. I was late to that one, too. You know why? I was welding my muffler back on my car. Yeah. But I had tried to impress this girl. And in some way, it must have worked because 25 years later, we're still together. Yeah. I know, right? Celebrating 20 years of marriage this year, too. I didn't think I'd ever make it. She didn't either. (laughs) But I wanted to impress her. I was worried that my my car wasn't going to be good enough or that my clothes weren't going to be good enough or that, you know, we we, it just, no matter what, I'm like, this has got to be perfect. And sometimes we fool ourselves when we think about that when it comes to our relationship with God. We think we have to be perfect in order to have this great relationship with God. I'm here to tell you, friends, that's never going to happen because God is perfect and we are not perfect. We couldn't be further from it. Paul points this out very clearly. He says, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners... He died for us while we were sinners. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Sinners and enemies of God. That's pretty bad. But yet God still comes to find us. God wants us. Because God wants us just as we are. We don't have to be perfect for him. We're never going to be perfect for him. We don't have to wear the right clothes. We don't have to go to the right church. We don't have to have the right kind of job. It doesn't matter what our past is, what mistakes we've made. I mean, Paul knew that. Paul was, was persecuting and imprisoning Christians. Moses was a murderer, and God used him. God wants us just as we are. It doesn't matter what we did is that he wants us and he wants that relationship with us and he wants it so badly and he knew that in order for us to have that relationship as Paul said we would have to be reconciled to him in some way so that we could have that relationship with him so he came up with this brilliant plan that he put into place for us and it's this The plan of salvation. God loved the world, the world, not just a couple people here and there, not just Adam and Eve. He loved the whole world so much that he gave his only son so everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. See, not only does God want to have a relationship with us and God wants us just as we are, but God also wants us to be saved. 
He wants us to accept that gift of salvation. Why does he offer that to us? Well, one, so that we, yes, we can be reconciled and have that relationship with him. But the other reason he wants that for us is because of this. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And a slave has no place in the family. But a child will belong to that family forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I love that he uses the, the phrase here, slave to sin. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm pretty sure it would be anonymous that if I asked, if, do we think slavery is, is bad? I think everyone would say, yeah, slavery is bad. There's not one good thing about it. But that's what we are. We are slaves to sin. Salvation gives us that triumph over sin. Salvation allows us to be free. We are no longer slaves. Because God wants us to be free. He designed us to have the free will. He gave us the ability to choose we see that again, going back to Adam and Eve. He gave them the, the option of free will. I want you to be free. You're not my slaves. I want you to be free. So here's the rules. Don't eat that. Now, they chose poorly. God creates his plan. And because, again, he wants us to be free. He never intended for us to be slaves. God wants us to be free. But the thing is, even if we take advantage of his gift of salvation, we allow ourselves to break free from the captivity and the slavery of sin. Does that mean we're perfect now? Does that mean we're not going to sin anymore? No. Because again, we're human. We're imperfect. We are going to make those mistakes. And again, God is all-knowing, so he knew this. So not only did he create a plan and a backup plan, he created up a backup backup plan. Because again, if we think we're not going to sin, then we're deceiving ourselves, right? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, this is the backup to God's plan is that, all right, I'm going to give you salvation. I'm going to make it so that you can be free from sin. But you're still going to mess up because you're human. I designed you. I know that. So now I want you to know that I will forgive you. You just have to come and confess to me when you do something wrong. And I'm going to forgive you. And not only am I going to forgive you, but I'm going to purify you from all unrighteousness. I'm going to forget about that sin as far as the east is from the west, according to the Psalms. He's going to let us move on from that because God wants us to be forgiven. He doesn't want us to be tied down with the burden of knowing we messed up. What's interesting about this, though, is even though God forgives us, again, in that human, that imperfect form, do we forgive others? No, we're supposed to. But we have a hard time with that, don't we? God tosses it aside. It's forgotten about. We sometimes can't forget about it. Sometimes we can't forget about our own sin. Even though God has forgiven us, we still hold on to, well, I really screwed up that time. Or sometimes it's somebody else wrongs us. And we have a hard time letting go of what they did to us. And when we do that, it renders us ineffective. See, just as God wants us to be forgiven, he wants us to forgive others. As I said, when we, when we hold on to those things, it renders us ineffective because it creates this negative mind space for us because we start harboring things like hostility and resentment, anger, bitterness. All things that drag us down, not things that build us up. And when we hold on to those things, we become burdened with them. And when we burden ourselves with those kind of things, 
We just get stuck. And we become of absolutely no use to God. No use to the kingdom. So what do we do in those situations? Well, the good news is, we got lots of ways to deal with it. Really, it's pretty simple. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Come to me, you who are burdened. Take my yoke upon you, for mine is light and easy. This is the one that I often turn to. Is in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I love that word, fortress. When I was a kid, my brothers and I would build forts in the woods all the time. And I mean, we, we, we didn't like, like put a couple of sticks up with a flag on it. No, we built forts. I don't know what we were preparing to battle against because there was nothing out there except maybe a couple of woodchucks. But we would work together as a team and we'd move these giant logs and we'd stack them up and we built, I mean, some very impressive forts. That's what God is for us. God is our stronghold. He is our fortress. When we are struggling, when we are hurting, when we're sad, when we're angry, when we're anxious, when we're depressed, whatever you might be feeling, whatever you might be struggling with, bring it to God and give it to him because he wants to take it from you. Go seek shelter in his arms. Find peace and comfort in his refuge, in his fortress. Let him be your help in those times of trouble. And he does this for us because God wants to protect us. Just as any parent would want to protect their child, God is our heavenly father and he wants to protect us. And why does God do all of this? Why does God give us salvation? Why does God offer us freedom from sin? Why does he give us this plan of forgiveness? Why does he want to protect us? Because ultimately, yeah, he does want what's best for us. But I want everyone to hear me out right now. God does this because he has a plan for us. Every single one of us. There isn't one person alive that God does not have some kind of plan or purpose for their life. We may not always know it. We may not always understand it. But God has this. In Jeremiah, we read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. See, when Jeremiah wrote this, Israelites were going into captivity, 70 years of captivity. That's a long time. And Jeremiah was probably a little frustrated at this point because he had been preaching to them and telling them, this is what's going to happen. You need to repent. This is what's going to happen. Nobody's listening to him. And so he's going, God, what, why? Why is this happening? I thought you wanted what's best for me. He says, don't worry. I have a plan for you. It's not a plan for harm. I have a plan that's going to help you prosper and it's going to give you hope. That doesn't mean there won't be bumps in the road along the way. That doesn't mean we won't struggle from time to time. Hopefully it doesn't mean we're going to be in captivity for 70 years. But God has a plan. And not only that, God wants you to know his plan and purpose for your life. If you're like me, and I struggled to know what his plan was. I mean, as far back as junior high, I knew God wanted me to do something. But I fought him because I was like, no. I thought I knew what God's plan was. I thought God wanted me to be a pastor like my grandfather and my dad and some of my uncles and my brother. I, or I thought God wants me to go and be a missionary overseas like my aunts and uncles or my cousins. I'm like, that's not me, God. I can't do that. You know what I found out? That wasn't God's plan for me. I thought I knew better than God. And you know why I didn't know what God's plan for me was? Because I wasn't growing 
in my relationship with God. It all comes back to that relationship, friends. If you don't know that God has a plan for you, or you're unsure of what that plan is, I challenge you to dig into your relationship with God, and guess what? He'll reveal it to you. He'll let you know what his plan and purpose for your life is because he wants you to know it. So we started off by asking the question of how do you know God wants the best for you? Well, first of all, obviously, God comes to find us. He seeks us out because he wants that relationship with us, right? But again, why does he do that? It's because God wants us. He wants us just as we are. We don't have to be perfect for him. We're never going to be perfect for him. He wants us to be saved. He offered that gift. He gave his son to die for us so that we could have that. He wants us to accept salvation. He wants us to be free. He doesn't want us to be slaves to sin. He doesn't want us to be tied down with that. He wants us to be forgiven. He wants us to be able to go and say, I messed up. And know that he's going to forgive us and his grace and mercy abides and we can move on with life. And he wants us to do the same for others. He wants to protect us. He wants to be our shelter, our fortress, our refuge. He wants to be the one to comfort us when we're struggling or when we're hurting. And he wants us to know that I have a plan and a purpose for your life and it's going to be for the good. The bottom line is, how do we know God wants the best for us? Because God wants us. He wants us. And the reason God wants us is because he's the person most ready to act on the things happening in your life. I have friends that I know I can call and say, I need you here right now. And they would be there as fast as they could get there. God's already here. He's ready to act. He's ready to take action. He's ready to move in and take control. All you got to do is surrender to him. God wants us. I am very much into athletics and sports. I coach. I play. I love sports. So when I think about wanting, I think about sports teams, especially as a coach. We're, we're, my varsity soccer team um, is going to lose a bunch of seniors. So I'm actively recruiting throughout the school, trying to find other kids to bring over to play soccer because I want to have a winning team. And I'm like, well, I want you. Yeah, you, you don't need to play football. I want you to come play soccer. You, I want you for moral support. You'll be good on the bench. I don't really say that. I encourage everyone to try out for the team. I want players for my team. I want a winning team. Guess what, folks? God is recruiting for his team, and his team will win because he's God. He doesn't lose. We are being recruited to the winning team. God wants us. God wants you. Turn to your neighbor. Tell him, God wants you. And now make it personal. God wants me. God wants me on his team. Why does God want the best for me? Because he wants me. So if you ever find yourself asking this question, how do you know? Just remember, God wants me. Let's pray together. God, it is so awesome that you want us. Sinners, unworthy, and yet you want us. Not only do you want us, you desire us, you seek us, you come find us. the creator of the universe, the God Almighty, and you want little old me. 
when I think about it like that, it, it is humbling. And at the same time, it's a little embarrassing because I think to myself, what have I done to seek you and to desire you in such a way? God, I pray as we leave here today that that would be one thing that, that sticks in our minds, that we, that we know that you want us and desire us and that we would in turn want and desire you in the same respect and that we would use that and, and feed ourselves with that and grow in our relationship with you and take those next steps. Father, I pray for the person that might be here today that maybe feels like they aren't worthy, that they aren't wanted or they aren't loved. God, you want them. You love them. And even though we may be unworthy of you, that can all be changed through salvation, through that reconciliation of the blood of Jesus. Thank you for that salvation, God. Thank you for that perfect plan. Thank you for your forgiveness, for your protection. We love you and we praise you. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.